I want to just go down some of Mike Elizondo's production credits very quick. Okay, go ahead. He's got some. First of all, he's got. Hold on, this is Mike credits. Elizondo he's, who makes beats with Dr. Dre. Just for the first of all, he's got songwriting credits on the real Slim Shady, "Bitch Please," to "I'm Black" and "Who Knew" off the Marshall Mathers LP as a songwriter. So he was in the studio for that. Okay. He's got Mike. He's got production credits for "True Lies" and "Lay Low" off the Last Meal. I think the question should be, why and don't we? Why oh, don't we mention? Why don't we mention people doing. like him when we talk about producers, though? You know what I mean? Like anybody who's attached to a big name producer, somehow we just leave them out of the conversation nah. altogether. Mike, I'm not done. Writing credit for Hennessy and Buddha off the last meal too. Mm-hmm. Um, songwriting credits for Exhibit Don't Approach Me featuring Eminem. Songwriting credit for Let Me Blow Your Mind. Mm. That was probably him playing that guitar. That I can, bing, 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 I can bing, believe bing, that. Bing, bing. Yep, that's probably him. He probably him. created it, yeah. If it wasn't yeah. a sample that had to be recreated. On Buster Rhymes, The Genesis, he's got songwriting credits for Holla, Bounce, Break Your Net, mm. Truck Volume, Family Affair, mm. songwriting credit. Like, you know what songwriting credit is when you're a producer, right? Yeah. Yeah. That means you came up with it. Mm-hmm. Like the, 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 the original riff and chord you hear in the records that I'm listening to. The listening? melody is the writing, the songwriting. The melody is the songwriting. So think about this. Let me blow your mind. Break your neck. These are pretty big hits. Family Affair by Mary J. Bryce. Did she not just perform that at the Super These Bowl? These are huge records. Lay low, Mike. That was what you were saying was like, that, that with Bitch Please was the comebacks. Yeah. You know, right? Um, let's go to some more. Uh, when he Bilal, Sally. Oh, on that Eminem. Is crazy. Yeah. Songwriting credit for Sally. That's what I'm saying. All first born second. Because mm-hmm. Dre did work on there too. That's probably how he ended up on that project. Because remember the lead single was Fast Life with Dre and Kiss. Fast Life was crazy. That beat was hard. That, that beat was crazy. Yeah. Eminem show, Say What You Say. That's the Dre track. Another another songwriting credit. So he, that means he laid the foundation for that track too. Say goodbye to Hollywood and business on the Eminem show. Mm-hmm. Elizondo songwriting credit. Satisfaction by Eve production and songwriting credit. I can hear his style now that you're going through these records. You can hear like these when riffs, you hear can't satisfaction. You? you hear biz, get down to business. Eminem. Let like me you blow can your hear, mind. Yeah. Lay low. Like, yeah. You're hearing lay low and let me blow your mind. Dun, 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 yeah. brum, it's brum, that brum. pocket, that rhythm. It's that pocket. Oh, Mike, we're about to. Oh, look at this, Mike. Get Rich or Die Trying. Mm. He's got production and songwriting credits on If I Can't and In the Club. Well, here it is. No, we're not done, Mike. He's also got songwriting credits for Patiently Waiting, Heat, and Back Down. Jeez. We're, Mike, the OB Trice shit hits the fan. Production and songwriting credit. Look in my eyes and O oh, are songwriting and production credits to Mike Elizondo. The setup, the best song on there. On OB Trice's Cheers, the setup. Mm-hmm. This is what I'm gonna say, man. Me. Shout out to Jermaine Dupree because he always gives um 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 uh, dang, uh name slips me. Uh Michael. You know Mike Mulder. No, 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 no. Uh, um it come to me in the chat. His writing partner. Um he always gives him credit. And I know that sounds like a mute point now since uh hold on now. I I can't do my man like that. Mike. While you're looking, I'm going to yeah. keep going through Mike Elizondo. Popping them fangs off Beck for Mercy. Yeah, that's right a crazy record. That record's crazy. Mike, Rich Girl, Gwen Stefani. Mm-hmm. Well, Eminem, even though that's Encore, a remake, ass, but yeah. Mike, Ass Like That, Just Lose It, Encore from Rain Man off the Encore album, production, songwriting credits, all through it. Mm. 50 Cent, Out of Control, production and songwriting credits. Guns Come Out, production and songwriting credit. Mike... This is what the game is talking about. Mm-hmm. No, listen, the documentary, West Side Story, the right, the right songwriting credit is Mike Elizondo on Hire. These are all the Dr. Dre chats, Mike. This is what he's talking about. The five Dr. Dre tracks. Remember I told you the documentary has a five piece mm-hmm. of Dr. Dre tracks? Well, here's your proof. Don't Worry is produced and song written by Mike Elizondo. So that's not Dre. How We Do is the same, Mike Elizondo. Higher songwriting credit, Mike Elizondo. West Side Story, songwriting credit, Mike Elizondo. 
Mike Elizondo made these tracks. Game is right. You know what songwriting credit is when you are a musician, Mike. It is the melody that you play that is the original credit, which means he created these melodies, not Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre would be down as the songwriter. Brian Michael Cox is who I'm thinking about. My name, you know, we doing live television, so names slip me sometimes. But yes, oh, oh shout yeah, out to yeah, Jermaine yeah. Dupree. He Mike, always gives Mike. He always give Brian Michael Cox his props. He does. And I'm not. And, and I'm just going through Mike. I'm just going through Mike Elizondo's rap production credit. I want you to understand this man's worked with Fiona Apple, the Jonas Brothers, Alanis Morissette. Mm. So he's a producer, producer. Mm. Okay. Mike, Nas is Hustlers off Hip Hop is Dead. The songwriting credit goes to Mike Elizondo. That means Dre just came and finished that up, too. That was Elizondo's shit, too. That's what Game is talking about when he's saying he's never really rapped on a Dr. Dre beat because the game is on Hustlers, too. Mm. You're like, oh, no, Dre didn't make that beat. Mike Elizondo made that beat. Dre I came was there. in. Yeah. And right? it's different so, when you so see that. Game is talking in code, Mike. Game's talking in code, letting you know, no, 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 that's Mike Elizondo's shit. Remember, I've been telling you about Mike Elizondo all this time because when me and Obi used to listen to The Chronic 2001, he used to be like, Mike Elizondo is the one that's playing like the strings on here and like the guitar shit, like that shit that you're hearing. He's like, that's a bad motherfucker. And he was telling me about the other stuff. You know what I'm saying? Because this is a few years after The Chronic 2001 it came out, so he had done other work by then. It's and different so when the game familiar. comes in there, comes in the studio as an artist, and he sees Kanye out there working with the Beat Machine or whatever he's working on, or he sees Premier working or whatever, and then they make a beat, give it to him, and he raps on it. He's saying probably he's never seen Dre do that. Right, Mike. This guy's worked with everybody. Maroon Five is on here. Cheryl Crow, mm -hmm. Carrie Underwood. So this dude. So Sierra's why are we not talking here. about about him more? Love, Sex, Magic by Sierra. That's Mike Elizondo's songwriting credit. Wow. Wow. He's everywhere. Let me get See, to these super this, chats real hold quick. Hold on. This dude got <laughs> some paper, Mike. <laughs> of course like, There's does. bangers on here from every genre of music that you can want to think of all the way up until recently, and he's not even 50 years old yet. Oh, this wow. is the guy we need to be checking for because a lot of this, this modern-day Dre stuff, pretty much from 2000, Mike. It's him. Or he's a big he, part he, of. He's been a big, big part of the biggest stuff, Mike. I mean, we just went through in the club and how we do with the bangers, aren't they? Yeah. Aren't those Dre's like biggest modern day bangers is how we do it in the club? Well, I was going to say uh, Family Affair, too, from Mary. That's a classic. That's got it's, Mary. Well, my Elizondo songwriting credit, that means he created those original tunes. Yeah. That means Dre came in and, and finished the job but did not create from scratch. Right. And so, Mike, with this right here, give me RZA. Well, you know what? Anybody who. I'll put it this way. Somebody that big, like Dr. Dre, if he has to share the songwriting or production credit with somebody who is not as heralded, more than likely, Elizondo probably did most of the work. Right? Bull Collar Hustle with I mean, the Super Chat Because here's the thing about it. Go Dre ahead. gave Elizondo his start. Elizondo doesn't have a discography before working with Dre on uh, The Last Meal. Right. And working on uh, the Marshall Mathers LP. So, you know, I guess that's part of the whole Discover credit thing. But then you'll see after that G unit time, well, he really doesn't work with him like that, like that. You know and what I mean? He goes off and Hustlers does his own thing. And a couple of Eminem records, that's 2007. And after that, he goes and does his thing thing. Mm. Let me get to these super chats real quick. Blue Collar Hustle says, I honestly feel like because RZA was God body and was uplifting black men and not chronic and gin and juice. He doesn't get the credit he deserves. Mm. It's an interesting theory. I mean, we've seen okay. that all over the genre. Uh, Andrew Green with the Super Chat says, if not now, then in March, you should do an album bracket with uh, the top 20, I'm sorry, 64 albums, rap albums of all time. If not albums, do uh, 64 songs. Then decide the brackets on Patreon. I think that's a great idea. We did a uh, album, bra oh no, it was a rapper bracket way, way back in the day, early on in According to Hip Hop, before we had the YouTube channel, when we were just on Facebook and we were using their polling mechanisms and stuff to find the greatest rapper of all time. So yeah, I'm down to update that and really get the people involved this time, since we're speaking to the people now. Uh, CJ Kid says, the Prince slash Havoc song is Thou Shall Not Kill. Uh, Prime Prodigy of a Prince Pianos. Dope. Uncle Fran with the Super Chat says, yes, Just Blaze versus Havoc. 
Coop for the first win. <laughs> uh, 36 Chamber says, why do we let early single releases like Diet Coke and Neck and Wrist affect the album ratings? Isn't the quality of the music still a major factor? It is. But I just think that the way that music comes so fast now, if a song's been out for three weeks, it feels like it's been out for three months. You know what I mean? And it's um, some of them songs just didn't have to be put out there. Neck and wrist didn't have to be put out there. See, this is what I mean. Okay, so are you watching how Griselda's packaging the list too right now? Yeah. They're packaging the list too. They're not packaging the music and overplaying the music. She's got Paula Dean out. They shot a video for it. But they're not tossing it around everywhere. They're tossing everything around, as in they're doing full promo. They're showing her BET cipher. You know what I mean? Verse, yeah. which was which was the best verse on there, in my opinion. They're showing her made you look freestyle over the made you look beat. You know, they got hundred dollar hiccup bubbling on the underground. They got the Liz two gear dropping, I believe, tomorrow, merch wise, to prepare you for it. You're getting a little bit of everything. You're not just getting beat with this one song over and over again to drag it out. It's called creating a buzz. And they're doing it in about a four to five week time period. Yeah. Yeah. Four to five weeks. It's like this this buzz literally started about four or five weeks ago. The Liz two drops next Friday. I'm waiting for it. Done. LP with the super chat we're all says, excited. You want to know part of why we're excited? Well, not only is she nice and not only is she beautiful, but they've actually marketed it to her audience properly to yeah. get us excited. Like those of us that want her to win, those of us that have been following her, we're watching how they're marketing and promoting and like, well, that's how you market and promote something, damn it. Well, you know what? This is the thing too. And I know this isn't the same exact thing, but... Shit, it's not that difficult. But if you were releasing, if you were anticipating the release of a film would you want to see five or six different full out scenes no. that takes away from what you're about to see you know what I'm saying I mean, like, to be give honest me with one you clip when they drop Paula and, when, I'm sorry no I was just going to say give me one clip and then keep that anticipation going I mean, That's why when we they do dropped Paula Dean, I was slightly worried I was like what's wrong with $100 hiccups Stove and Benny and her snapping on there too but then I was like, but then you ain't heard nothing else. And now you got the BET cipher, and then you got the major look free. So I'm like, oh, never mind. I'm like, okay, there you go. All right. So <laughs> LP says, LP says, facts, Mike. We don't even mention Chad with Pharrell. Dre and Kanye have the most, um, uh, I guess, ghost producers of any of our top producers. Havoc, Tip, Cream, don't. And, you know, I think. The thing is, at least with Ye, and even if you talk about Tip when he had um, Dilla, they acknowledged the guys. And we knew that Dilla was Dilla even when he was working with Q-Tip. You know, and I think that the lack of acknowledgement of the, the mailmen, the Elizondos, and, you know, to, to a certain extent, Daz, Yella, I think that's a problem. It's nothing wrong with having, um, you know, production help. But I just hate to see people who are doing so much work and who are so talented not get any credit, you know? Uh, even, I mean, when, even when Timbaland teamed up with Danger, we knew what Timbaland was like without Danger. We knew what Tim, we knew that Timbaland really made, you know, Missy so, not Missy so addictive, but Superfly and shit like that. One in a million. It's, no, it's good to... It's good to try different things, even production wise, just like, you know, just like MCs get together and do albums and do like guest verses with each other, work on stuff together. You know what I mean? It's the same way producers be a get together. You know what I mean? Even if it's infrequent, like look at the way like Nas and Raekwon get together. It's like, no, producers should be able to do the same thing from yeah. time to time. It's cool. But what I just pulled out, what feels like is a trail that says that one guy is going in here and creating the work and the other guy is coming back and cleaning it up and fixing it. I told you, that's an executive producer. That's an engineer. That's not your producer. And so you don't have that. And this is what I mean. You don't have that going on with RZA. Because here's what I tell you. And this is why I appreciate the run so much. It's like, if the best thing we got, like what you taking off of RZA in that run, it's like Fourth Disciple did Scary Hours, right? I believe so, yes. And True Ma and True Master did the MGM in Brooklyn Zoo, right? I believe so. True Master also did Fish off of Iron Man. 
Remember fish? We mm-hmm. eat fish, toss salads, and make rap ballads. He true master did fish. And other than that, I can't think of any epic. Didn't Fourth Disciple or one of them do heaters? Mm-hmm. Like, Mike, it's few and far in between that the heat doesn't belong to RZA. That's a lot of classic shit. It's like those only tracks that, 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 that made it to the board. You feel what I'm saying? And Because you know that those are the tracks that made it to the board because he gave him credit when it made it to the board. Because think about this. He had every reason and it was in very much position to put his name down on Brooklyn Zoo and nobody would have said it. Oh, straight up. This straight is what up. I'm going to say, too, man. <laughs> I remember when he played Brooklyn Zoo on, on Versus and people made a deal about that. And he said, shit, it was made on the equipment that I bought or something he said. Anyway, <laughs> what I was going to say, though, I I do want to piggyback on something that you just said and the fact that it is technically on a traditional producer's role. It is the producer's job to come back and clean up and do those things. But in hip hop, what we've seen from producers, they have to do everything. And so, yes, from a traditional standpoint, if we're putting Dr. Dre in the conversations of the Quincy Joneses of the world and, you know, and those type of producers stylistically, yes. But when it comes to hip hop, hip hop producers have to do all the cleaning up. They have to do the synchronizing. They have to do everything except for engineering most of the time. You know what I mean? Right. And I think it's unfair for us to put a person on the pedestal that doesn't do the traditional work that a hip hop producer does, but does the work that a traditional hip hop producer does. You know what I mean? It's two different well, see, worlds. Okay. <coughs> I think one of the things that often gets understated about Wu-Tang Clan, and I'm gonna be very careful with what I'm about to say. Mike. You understand that Method Man and Raekwon are the only ones that really have great voices. You do understand that, right? I think Ghost has a great voice. I think Ghostface Killer does not have a great voice. I think Jizza has a great voice. I think Dirty has a great voice. Great? No, Mike. Don't toss great great around like that. When I mean great, I mean like your voice is like legendary. Yeah, they're not all time. The only all time great voices in that crew, including Old Dirty Bastard, is Raekwon and them. Their voices are better than the the rest of the clan. It is, Mike. Come on. Like, you know that. Meth and Raekwon have the voices, like the rap voices. And here's what I mean about the rap voice. With those guys, play the beat. I got you. Kind of like on some Q-tip shit where it's like anything can go. With the rest of those guys, what I'm saying You have to actually do more of a production job. They're all great lyricists, Mike. They're all great lyricists. They're not all great songwriters. They don't all have great voices. The job that RZA did making everybody sound great and sounding solo worthy is one of the more noteworthy and notable things. They sounded good enough collectively that everybody was able to go solo. That's a producer doing his job to a zenith because, yeah, you can put meth and Raekwon over anything and it sound good, i.e. meth versus chef, where they literally freestyle over the beat and it's good enough to make an album. But that's not how Old Dirty Bastard's album was made. I'm not going to lie to you. With that being that's not said, how Swords was made. With that being said, I would imagine the return to the 36 Chambers had to be the most difficult album to ever that's produce. That's what I'm saying. Doc, I'm going to put- say this. When dealing with a personality like that, Dr. Dre would have never completed Dirty's album. Ever. <laughs> that album would have never saw the light of day. You couldn't even complete a Rakim album. How are you going to deal with some... You hear people telling stories about how difficult it was to get one verse out of Old Dirty. He made a whole album with the man. And it's a great album. And it's a long album, too. Like, it's not like it's 10 or 11 songs. It's like 17 yeah. records on there. It's a whole album. Yeah, that might be one of the most impressive production he jobs made, he ever. Made, he, made, he made Method Man's first album on a tour bus, Mike. That's what I'm saying. Like Dealt with the flood and everything. Uh, CJ Kidd the with flood. the Super Chat says... He uh, made Purple Tape, Mike. Yeah. He made all the beats on the Purple Tape. All of them. CJ, all of them. CJ Kidd says, do a Mike Elizondo versus somebody for the Patreon. LOL. Um, Jay Short says, uh, Justin Elizondo versus Dr. Dre. <laughs> uh, Eric Terrell with the Super Chat says All of the songs you named are old songs Sample music, no original songs He has a lot of help Dr. Dre uh, told him what to do Okay 
Um, LP with the super chat says, Tip is the real goat. Change the game. Uh, no, no code credits. Um, and he'll tell you how he made the records too. Uh, Eric Terrell with the super chat says, Who is your favorite coach slash um, director, chef? I'm sorry, chief. They may uh, help all of them have help. RZA has help. Trust me, even hip hop. No, that's what I'm saying. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is, is that his help has been fourth disciple and true master, and they've gotten credit for their help. It's like that's what I mean. It's like the MGM and Brooklyn Zoo and Scary Hours don't say regular records. Well, like, RZA, so obviously what those dudes are making, the heaters, no, those aren't regular beats that True Master and Fourth Disciple are making. They're getting their credit to get in when those beats are dropping. But Mike, Shadow Boxing, Fourth Chamber, no, no, Liquid Swords, Investigative Reports, all the beats on the purple tape. What RZA, Shimmy Shimmy Ya, Raw Hide, Snakes, Bring the Pain. Yeah. What RZA and Manny Twitch? Fresh did, what RZA and Manny Fresh did was they set a culture. Nate Triumph did yeah. make Triumph. Impossible. Riz yeah. Rizza and Manny Fresh set a culture. That's what they did. That was a war. Yeah. It's everywhere. That's what I mean. It's like, what type of beat do you want him to make? He made every type of beat that you could make because he had to for his clan. Like, for the clan. For the sake of the clan, he had to make every style of beat. There wasn't one style of beat that he could make. I'm saying Method Man and Ray were literally probably the only cats he could just throw a rap beat too, and they would just go get busy on. Like, I guarantee you, like the rest of them ain't going to sound as good on incarcerated Scarface faces as Ray. That's a rapper's rapper beat. He got a rapper's rapper voice. That beat for Ray. I like, wanna, Ghost I wanna, not going to sound as good on that record if Ghost is in the studio that night. I want to ask a question, though, and, and I'm not being funny. You know, I, I learned how to play an instrument when I was in sixth grade. You know, it was pretty cool. damn good, too. But... And I carried that all the way through college. But with that being said, Dre is 20-something years in the game at the time that Mike uh, Elizondo and him start working together. And I know that it was, it was said here in the Super Chat that he told Elizondo what to do, but with Dre being the producer at the level That's that he is... That's an executive producer. No, but with Dre being the producer that he is at the level he is, why didn't he learn how to play any instrument and play on any of those records? Elizondo obviously brought something to the table. I think it's a little deeper than just <laughs> telling somebody what to do. I mean, I don't think Dre is a guy who's just, you know, starting off. You you know what you want to hear. Why don't you pick up an instrument and be able to do a little bit of that, too? I mean, you know, Prince did it. He's a different beast, obviously. I think Rakim said... He played the bass line for um, Know the Ledge because he knew what he wanted to hear. And again, Rakim's somebody who grew up playing the same instrument that I played, saxophone. Yeah, he's a saxophone. Yeah, so, I mean, again, I don't like when people try to write these musicians off. It's like, yeah, Dre brought you in and just told you what to do. But if, it, if the guy was just a regular studio musician... Dre would have learned how to play that instrument and done all of those things himself as well. You know that story about Nerd, right? Which one? Well, like so Caleb, basically, um, you know, Chad and Pharrell and the group Nerd with um, Shea, uh, Shea as well. They made the first album. Um, I love that album, man. They made the first album and it had like a lot of the Neptune sounding beats on it, but it didn't sound full. Uh, in Search Of. And so yeah. they brought a band in to actually, you know, replay all of this stuff. And so they were like, well, shit, we got to go on tour. We don't know how to play any of this stuff. They learned how to play all of this stuff and went on tour and then, and then played everything on their second album. They didn't need that backup band anymore. You know what I mean? That's what producers do. You go out there and you learn how to play instruments. It is what no. it is. No, you, you, you're right. Like, Wyclef plays instruments. Um, yeah. You know, bring up Prince and somebody else playing instruments other than Stevie Wonder is not fair to the other person. No, we're not even going to talk about them. We'll talk far. about Clef. We'll talk about uh, Chad. We'll talk about Pharrell. Shit, we'll even talk about Timbaland. You know what I'm saying? I believe, like, I believe Dr. Dre can play some piano or keyboard. I refuse to believe that he can't. He can, yeah, he can play. I say he can play the piano or keyboard at, 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 a, at a minimum, Mike. No way. I refuse to believe that Dr. Dre cannot get... Like, if you were to sit a sheet of music in the piano in front of Dr. Dre right now, I believe he could play for you. Okay. So, 
I do believe that. Yes. Maybe he probably can't play anything else, but I believe he can play the piano. And I'm not going to knock him because, you know, playing the piano can get you a long, long way. So Definitely. Uh, Jay Show with the Super Chat says, with Nas, AZ, and, um, and Mega on a roll, would you be interested in another Firm album? Foxy will only have to spit as much as um, Dre on Stankonia. No diss. <laughs> uh, uh, would you be interested in the Firm album at this point? No? I mean, the Firm album, I mean, not to be funny, that's supposed to be executive produced by Dr. Dre, wasn't it? Well, supposedly, but we know that there was a lot of hands in the pot. But everybody's free now. Okay, so what would you say? I'd like a little. I mean, who do, who would you want to produce that at at this stage? Because they're all older now and a little bit more grown up. They're all, their rhetoric is all very much more grown man in a good way, and so I I would think you would want a more um, like I don't want to like throw out the easy ones and just say like Alchemist or Hit Boy. Who do you think sound wise, stylistically, would be able to give them a sound that would be special and make this really like a special reunion? I don't know. I think I'm more I interested. I'm more interested in a Nas and A Z album at this junction than I am a firm album. And I say that respectfully. I only say that because we're coming off of Doa Do Doa Die Two, K D two, and Magic. No, I mean Megas Megas the realness too is tight, but No, it's tight. Yeah. But it's like I, I mean, Foxy's hear the only one. I mean, Foxy's really the only unknown in the situation. Those three guys have all just proven literally. I mean, with Mega just dropping the other week, that they're yeah. still very much capable of making dope, dope ass rap material. No, so, definitely. So she's the only. She's the only question mark. Mike, Mike, how would? I know this is going to sound strange, and we've just bought them up. I think that they would need like a kind of. I would love to see them do like a kind of more grown up, funky type of thing this time around. And Mike, DJ Quick. I like that. I like that. And that's Quick. another. You know what? We always forget Quick. He's another guy who went out there and learned how to play, I instrument, play instrument. Yes, and he, he applied it to his production talents. Man, like yeah. again, I, I don't know if it's a little easier when you're younger, but yeah, me from sixth grade to ninth, tenth, or whatever. We're talking about like a four year span on my instrument i'm like a rock star on that bitch and you're telling me people who professionally make music and this is your claim to fame this is what you do you're in the studio 20 something years straight and you don't know how to play a certain instrument i don't understand that because you've had time and resources and money to learn correct and experience and just being around musicians like if yeah. you're around musicians 24 7 you're gonna pick up something yeah, uh, I mean, just me, the, uh, and, and this is what I mean, Mike, the competitor in me, if I was the person in the room that couldn't play instrument, I'd be sitting next to whoever knew the most and figuring out, like, that's like, why, you know, and that? I'm not trying what to, what do I got to do to do that? I'm not What's trying that? to be what funny. Is that? How do I got to hold the guitar? Like, what do I need to do? <laughs> right. What? Hello? Message? That's why, man, I'm not trying to be funny, but... You know, even with 3,000 and him, you know, carrying around the guitar and really never playing it, I just never understood that, man. Like, I, you know, I was, when they did Coachella, I thought it would have been so epic. And Prince was still alive then. He was actually back sh backstage at that show. If he would have been able to pull out a guitar and play songs like Prototype, and like really do them shits, man. Like somebody who can play the instrument, them things would be epic. The Love Below was built for an artist who could play an instrument and translate those records live and sing them meant, live as well. It was meant for a band. It was meant for a band, yeah. And, and it was, and I hate to say this because I love The Love Below, but it it sold records, it did its thing, but I think it would be iconic if it could have translated live. I think that's why we still don't hear a lot of the things from that record. If we had live performances to connect that album with, that would be an iconic record. And unfortunately, because there was no tour with it, he didn't translate those songs live. He wasn't able to, you know, like you said, either sing those live or perform those with the band or him as an instrumentalist live. The record just 
is where you it don't is. Think the album's iconic though, because I I would disagree with that. I don't know, man. I don't think that the music carries. I love the album. Don't get me wrong. I don't want my words to be twisted up. I love the album, <coughs> but I think that we would still be talking about the album and individual songs on it if they had performances to go with them. If we had performances to go with She Lives in My Lap, or we had, you know, actual concerts for Hey Y'all, or, you know, concerts for Prototype and things like I mean, that, I think that no, it would right. be different. I think Happy Valentine's Day. These records need have should have been translated live, and the fact that they didn't, it, it really crippled. I don't want to say the legacy of the album, but you know what I mean the leg, the legs of those records. This should have been able to be a repackaged live version of that album. Really, no, you're right. Um, I think you know they're a missed opportunity. Like an album like that, had he been able to play an instrument like a guitar and have a band, it would have been perfect for an intimate like MTV Unplugged type yeah. of setting or like a Tiny Desk concert type of vibe or something like that. Yeah, so there's there's some opportunities missed, but that hasn't helped uh, prevented people from still waxing poetic about its brilliance. Oh yeah, it's an incredibly written and produced album. I, yeah, I mean, and how performed about this? in the it's, studio. It, that, that, can you that, imagine that, if he had Anderson Pat? Right. Can you it's, imagine it's, if he had Anderson Pat skill set as far as a live? Po- you know what I mean? No, I get what you're saying. What I was going to submit to you is that just from a rapper's perspective, it is like, you know, like what the love below is is kind of what Kendrick just tried to pull off with Mr. Morale. You, you know what so? I'm saying? Yeah, he tried to do like this uh, thematic, orchestrated play type of thing. Like the love below is a play to me. You know that, right? Yeah, I, I just don't it. consider it to be hip hop because he's really story. not rapping on there. Yeah, but the theme of it is built out and organized and staged more like a play made for Broadway, very much like Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. But that's when it goes down to execution. You know what I'm saying? And that's why we're not a fan of double albums because too now we can look back at it and say it's like oh the doubleness of it kind of helped hurt some of the execution too because even the Love Below as great as it is, it's a little bit too long, Mike. A little bit too long. Slightly. Just a little. I, I want to get to the next topic. Right. I think that's a really good transition. I mean, we were going to talk about the tour, and I think we're going to get to that. But let me get to these Super Chats, and we'll get to this next topic. CJ Kid says, uh, what holds Moment of Truth back from being a top 10 hip-hop album? I would love a deep dive on this. Um. I- you want to you want to tackle it right quick, or you what you want to do? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I mean, yeah, we can answer I'll t- the question. I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll tell you what my immediate thought is. There's the only thing that's really holding it back from being a top ten rap album is the more seminal moments from albums of comparable classic quality. I, I was thinking that too. Like because if you're just looking at, I told you, Mike, when I listen to it, album wise, it's easy that it's a top twenty five rap album for me just off the quality of it because you're not going to find a rap album with nineteen better songs. You're it, not. It's a like, better. Gonna, it's like, their best like, album to me. Oh, Mike. I, by far, in my opinion, actually, because it's the only one of their rap albums that I would have in my top 20. OK, yeah. like I would have it like I don't think you understand. I told you, I think the moment of truth, like song for song is better than reasonable doubt. I have it ranked high. I have it like slightly ahead of reasonable doubt and slightly behind. It's dark and hell is hot. Like it's dark and hell is hot as like a top 15 to 20 rap album to me. Mm-hmm. So it's like I would consider moment of truth to be a top 20 rap album and the only rap albums that are better than it aren't even necessarily better they're just more important the low end theory doggy style it takes a nation of millions the chronic i mean i say the chronic illmatic you know what i'm saying i think the groundbreaking nature of all of those records like you know what i mean you're naming some groundbreaking albums too and i don't think as great as moment of truth is i don't know if it has that groundbreaking nature that those records it's the only thing that it's missing that's what i mean it's the best it's the best rap album that you'll find that doesn't have like a groundbreaking nature to it it's just brilliant yeah like it's just brilliant rap cj kid also says um where do you rank prime prodigy on an all-time lyricist list Lyricist, lyrically, I would have to make that list out. Um, he would be lyrically top 20 for me, probably not top 10. When I think lyrically, I immediately think Rockem, Nas, Thought, G Rap, KRS, Pun, you know, Jizza. 
like those guys like come to me immediately like boom 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 bam when we're talking lyricists you know mm-hmm. so Eric I was Terrell, thinking probably he... on the back end of the 20 AZ is lyrically more inclined you know what I'm saying in my opinion like to be a lyricist like for me if we're like getting into the nuance of it you know he would just fall behind some guys but some pretty special guys but he has some special qualities too Thumbs up in the chat. We're going to talk Kendrick in a second, too, when I get through these uh, super chats. Eric Terrell says, uh, Prince played everything, plus he still had uh, Jesse Johnson, Jimmy Jam, Lisa, and Wendy. Um, Sheila E. They wrote a lot of music on his albums, but Prince is still Prince, just like Dr. Dre is still Dr. Dre, no pun intended. Let Um, me tackle that one right quick, Mike, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. That's kind of accurate, but kind of not accurate, because here's the difference. And I've always said this, like, first of all, Prince got a deal without anybody. They were the record industry was literally looking for the next Stevie Wonder. And Prince is who they turned up. So good pull by the industry. Okay, Mm -hmm. his best material, Mike, about I'd say. 70 percent of it is with Prince in the revolution. And I've always said that Mm -hmm. Prince and the Revolution are nowhere to be found on Sign of the Times, Mike. And it might be his greatest piece of work. And Dr. Dre does not have a piece of work like that where he where like where he like. No, he does not. Dr. Dre doesn't have a piece of work where it's just him anyway. That's what I'm saying. Did he have any help on? You know, this is the one. This is the one. Not to interrupt you. Did he have any help on the DLCs album? We'll have to pull it up and see. Yeah. Okay. But Mike, that's 1989. Yeah. I would. I, was I would say that's his seminal work if he had no help. But I think Yellow was around for that too. Probably. Uh, yeah. Most likely. But I. But I'm saying all of this to say that it's like that's different. He's always. It's always been kind of a group effort for Dr. Dre. He comes from NWA. Right. You know. CJ Kid with the Super Chat says thing. the Firm slash Mike Elizondo album. Yeah. We got to give people credit, man. I mean, that's just what it is. I mean, again, Rod Temperton always gets his credit and everything that he did with Michael when it comes to Rock With You, when it comes to the song Thriller itself. Like, there's never and there's been money no in the, And there's money in the credit, too, Mike. You yeah. know, like, a lot of it. It is. Because you get way more work when you're getting that credit. Uh, Mad Max of the Super Chat says,